morning, everyone. My name is Joelle, and this is our last week of the Fruit of the Spirit. I'm here today to teach you about self-control. We have learned a lot of Fruits of the Spirit, and I know we keep on talking about them and kind of recapping and trying to make sure that they're in our brains, uh, but I want to doubly make sure that we do that today just because it's our last Sunday doing them. So take a, uh, a trip down memory lane and remember when Irene and Susie and Sally um, told us about the Fruits of the Spirit way back when they started with love. They showed us this clip so that we could help remember each and every single one of them with some help from our Bay Park family. Take a peek. Love. Joy. Peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So for us talking about self-control, the very last one, self-control can mean a lot of different things if you're talking about different situations. We can have self-control um, of our emotions. We can have self-control of our choices. Um, and that looks kind of like, usually when people use the word self-control, they're thinking like there's something not good that you're thinking of doing and you have to have self-control not to do that thing. We can have self-control over pain, um, over our words, over many different things. And so we're going to try and explore a few different kinds um, of self-control, starting with one of my favorite things in the whole wide world that we always need to exercise control over, which is junk food. I love junk food and in many different ways. And I know that every, well, I know that there are lots of people out there who do as well. So take a moment and write in the chat, try to dig into your mind and think of a time when you lost self-control with a specific uh, thing, junk. Um, and maybe even it was good. Maybe you love apples, but you ate way too, too many. Losing self-control doesn't always have to be like with the negative things, but it is just about losing self-control. So for me, sun chips. I love sun chips and I have lost self-control and I've eaten a whole bag and I felt so gross afterwards. It was not good. So I always need to exercise self-control when I have sun chips in my hands. So guys, take a minute in the chat and share with us when have you left, uh, lost self-control and over what? Those were excellent. Thank you so much for participating and chatting at home. I hope that it can th uh, spark a lot of thoughts about what it looks like to lose self-control and how often and easily that can happen. So like I said, losing self-control doesn't always have to be with something negative, and it's certainly not always food or emotions. Um, this talk about it video has a really good example of losing self-control um, with choices. This girl, um, in our video was making poor choices and she lost self-control when she should have exercised a little bit more for the sake of her grades at school. So all of you older children paying attention with your families this morning, put yourself in this girl's shoes because it's a really good and important lesson. There are certain distractions in life and if we don't have self-control, we can take a turn down a difficult path. So enjoy the Talk About It video. I will see you guys after, um, probably after the object lesson. See you soon.
Hey guys, as you can see, this homework is a killer. I have a history test next week, and on top of that, I'm swamped with my science fair prep work. It's a lot, but thankfully, I'm on track to get it all done. And you know what? I haven't always been this focused. My priorities were way out of whack, and my obsession with social media and gaming was out of control. You see, I was vlogging when I should have been vacuuming. I was gaming when I was with grandma. I was texting instead of tidying. I was YouTubing when I should have been using my head. I was binge watching when I should have been baking. I was taking selfies when I should have been sleeping. Which meant I was sleeping when I should have been singing. <sighs> Honestly, I had no idea how bad things were getting until I started to get my homework back last semester. At first, I was getting A's. And then I started to get B's, which turned to C's, and then D's. And finally, an F. What was I gonna do? What was I supposed to do? I had to tell my mom. So that day, I showed my mom my failed assignment. I was terrified. What was she gonna say? She looked at it, and then looked at me, and then looked back at my assignment, and then back to me while shaking her head and said those famous two words. You are grounded. The next part is where it really hit home for me. My mom proceeded to tell me, you need to learn some self-control and get your grades back up. Until you do, your phone and video games are mine. And until you get your grades up to a B, this paper of yours is gonna live right here, right next to your list of chores. I was devastated. I was decimated. I thought I was doomed. That night, after the initial shock and wore off, I asked Jesus to give me the strength and self-control that I needed to turn things around. And you know what? I felt like Jesus was right beside me. Like he gave me the strength to turn things around. If God is for us, what can be against us, right? That next morning, I started scrubbing and scraping and feeding and dusting and clearing and folding and milking. <laughs> Just kidding. Just making sure you were paying attention. And at night, instead of swiping, I was studying. And instead of taking selfies, I was taking samples. And instead of FaceTiming, I was doing flashcards. And after a while, that F turned to a D. And that D turned into a C. And that C turned into a B. It's amazing that Jesus gives us the ability to have self-control. And he will help us when we ask. Now, I have a little ways to go to get my grades back to that A, but I think with these next couple assignments, I can do it with Jesus' help. I've got this. I decided to pop back really quickly and just review with you that distractions are very difficult things to have self-control over. That young girl just really, really enjoyed her electronics and her things, but they were keeping her away from her family and her grades at school. She wasn't focused and she needed to ask God for self-control. And God gives it to us. That is the most important thing that we need to remember from today's lesson is that if we ask for self-control, God can give it to us. And now we have to put on our thinking caps and think of who is the best example of self-control? And I'm sure we don't have to think very hard because our guy Jesus is a really good example of self-control. The perfect example of self-control because he had the most difficult thing to do in the whole wide world and he did not waver. He stayed on track and had self-control in an extremely painful situation. And I think that you guys all know what I'm talking about when he had to die on the cross. He had self-control and God gave it to him. He exampled it perfectly. And that's where we can learn from Jesus how to have self-control in our lives. So let's take a moment to do our Bible story. Um, and then we will finish with an object lesson. Thank you guys and see you soon. All right, guys, time for our Bible story. 
What do you uh, feel when you see a sign like this? So be honest. Does it make you want to do what it says? Why or why not? Discuss with your family at home because it is really interesting. When we see a sign like this, it makes us feel sometimes like that's exactly the only thing we want to do. Like when someone says, don't look, we sometimes look. And so today we're learning that self-control is a fruit of the spirit. And that means when there's something that you really want to do, but you know you shouldn't, God helps you have self-control. For example, if there's a present that you really want to touch, but it says, do not touch, God can help you. We're going to explore a time when Jesus showed self-control. But first, you'll need to draw a heart on a piece of paper. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to run and grab a piece of paper, or maybe mommy and daddy can grab one piece of paper, and you're going to draw a heart on it. Sometimes we show self-control because we're obeying a rule or because it's the law, but our heart really isn't in it. Jesus showed the ultimate example of self-control because of love. In his case, there was really something he didn't want to do, but he knew he needed to do it to show us his love, and so he did. He could have stopped at any point, but he kept doing it. Let's see exactly how Jesus showed self-control. So you'll see here the cross, and we all know that Jesus had to die on the cross, and here's why. Everybody tear your heart right down the middle, and we'll talk about why we did that in a sec. Jesus wants to be your friend, but we've all done wrong things, and that has broken our relationship with our pure, holy, and sinless God, so he had to do something to fix it. God's son, Jesus, had to take the punishment for the wrong things that we've done by dying on the cross. And that's not something he looked forward to doing at all, even though he had the power to save himself and avoid the cross. After Jesus allowed the soldiers to arrest him, things got worse. He let the soldiers nail his hands and feet to the cross and gamble for his clothes. And why do you think Jesus didn't stop the soldiers from humiliating him? He showed self-control. He could have stopped the pain and humiliation, but he didn't. He stayed focused on the solution to our broken relationship. Jesus could have stopped them from posting a sign that mocked him, but Jesus showed self-control and let them make fun of him. Think about a time that someone made fun of you. What would you have done if you could have stopped it? The crowd dared Jesus to come down off the cross and prove that he was God. And you know what? He could have. He had the power to hop off the cross, heal his wounds, and prove everyone wrong. But he didn't do it. He showed self-control and kept doing what he needed to do. The religious leaders were the people who had given Jesus a hard time his whole adult life. I bet he would have loved to prove them wrong and come right down off the cross. But he showed self-control and stayed on the cross. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, and that means it comes from God. But we can see how Jesus showed self-control by enduring the pain and humiliation and even death on the cross. But it was all worth it when he got to the end. Jesus died and came back to life three days later for us. And now, if you get some tape, you can tape your hearts back together because that's what Jesus did. He allowed our hearts to be put back together and our relationship with God to be made right. Hello guys, can you please introduce yourself for our object lesson starting with you Mr. in the blue shirt. Um, my name's Eli. And next to you is? Emmett Lister. And? Emmett Lister. And? Nice to meet you guys. Thank you for joining me. In front of you is some supplies. 
And we are doing a cool experiment today um, to help teach the kids about, maybe could you take a guess on what fruit of the spirit we're on? Um, self-control. Nice, good one Emmett, thank you. We are discovering that self-control is a fruit of the spirit. And I have this cool experiment for you that'll show you our self-control is strongest when we anchor ourselves in God's strength, okay? So we're going to have dad help us speed through the process of putting these objects in our balloons. And the kids will be using their plates in a moment too, but you'll see that we have chocolates in Eloise's, cotton balls in Edison's, money in Emmett's, and then these heavy magnet balls in Eli's. And the question will be, which is the best anchor? All right. And good to go. Okay, thank you, Dad, for helping get the balloon situated. And now, kids, pick up your plates, pretty please. And your job, don't do anything yet, exercise some self-control. Your job is to use the plate like a fan. And we're going to see which one stays anchored. Now, at home, I bet the kids are trying to guess which is the best anchor. The chocolates are pretty heavy, but there might not be enough of them in Eloise's balloon. The cotton balls, I think we all know Edison's are probably going to flow, his balloon's going to flow uh, when he blows air on it. But it's going to be really interesting to see if it's the, the purple balloon with the marbly magnet balls or the money that stays anchored. All right, so make your predictions at home. And guys, no, don't, don't, don't not yet. I'm going to count three, two, one. And... Kids, I want you to use your plates as fans. Three, two, one, go. Thanks guys so much for doing that. And now we're gonna cut to some questions. As you can see, Eli's only moved a hair and Emmett was anchored. Thank you. Say goodbye to the kids. Bye. Bye. So in conclusion today, everybody, I want you to remember that Jesus was the ultimate example of self-control. And in his case, he, he had the self-control to allow what was happening to him to happen in order to make our relationship restored. And I hope that you guys tape your heart back together because it's a beautiful symbol of what Jesus did for us. Our hearts are made whole only because of him. And the other thing that self-control can do is to stop us from doing negative things in our life, like eating too many sun chips, for me, 
and using our words to hurt people or or fight or disobey. We need to have self-control. And as you saw in the object lesson with the balloons, we need to be anchored. The money and the magnetic balls were really, really strong and anchored um, to keep them from blowing away. And so anchoring ourselves in God is the only way that we can have that much self-control. So I hope you've had fun today and I hope that this week is enjoyable. Next week, we get to begin on the Lord's Prayer. I'll show you a slide of the Lord's Prayer after this and our closing song. Bye-bye, guys. I miss you all and have a great week.
Good morning, Bay Park, and welcome this morning. My name is Rachel, and I'm one of the people here on staff at Bay Park. And I actually just finished a week-long course that has been super fascinating about spiritual being, spiritual conflict. And it's just been a, a reminder about this series that we're heading into, that we are not only physical beings, but that we're also spiritual beings. And making sure that we are not only aware of that, but learning to be healthy, physical, and spiritual, and emotional people. If you are new here this morning, our desire as a church is to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And so we look to Jesus as our model. Why? Because we believe that it's through him that we have life, true life. We have forgiveness. We find hope, meaning, and significance. And so if at any time in the service you have any questions, there's two things that you can do. There's going to actually be a button that pops up in the chat right now. And so you can click on that and that'll connect you with one of our hosts. Or if at any point later in the service you've got any questions, you can hit the request prayer button. Don't worry, it doesn't necessarily always mean you want prayer, even though that would be wonderful and we would love to pray with you. But it can just be you have a question or want some clarification or even some resources. We would just love to connect with you in any way. Well, before we head any further into our service, we're going to prepare our hearts to hear from God's word, to reflect on his character, to remember who he is in some time of song, of worship through song. And so, Bay Park, let's spend this time in meaningful worship together, whether that's through singing out loudly or sitting on your couch, engaging your heart and mind in looking to Jesus looking to God the Father, and in asking for the Holy Spirit's presence and moving in your heart and life. But he brought me in, oh, his love for me. 
Well, welcome again, Bay Park. Uh, so we love to ask a question in the chat because it's a helpful way for us to dialogue but also learn together. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm a verbal processor. And so if I need to like process things, sometimes I need to journal or write it out or call a friend just because it's helpful for me to process. And so for all you verbal processors, you can let us know in the chat kind of what you're thinking. And if you're, an, if you're an internal processor, if you're able to let us know in the chat, amazing. So... We know in, in James 4, 8, it says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. And there's some ways that we draw near to God. And some of these are called spiritual disciplines. And so I'm going to read through a list. And as I read through the list, I want you to find out or think through what are some that come really easy to you? What are some you really might struggle with? You can let us know in the chat, maybe your favorite one or one you're working on or one you're wanting to, to practice this week. And so uh, some of the spiritual disciplines are meditation, prayer, fasting, study, simplicity, solitude, service, confession, worship, and celebration. So let us know in the chat, maybe one that comes super easy to you, one that might be a little bit more of a struggle. For me personally, I know people might think worship comes really naturally, and maybe it does, but the one that popped off my head right away was actually solitude. Sometimes I love to just get alone with God and get silent and just have some time to hear from Him, like especially out on a run and just know that I have some moments to pray, to think through, to really seek the leading of the Holy Spirit. And one that I'm definitely working on this week is prayer. I think for me that one is, is a growing, capital D, discipline. So let us know in the chat where you're at and what your favorite ones are. So this week, we have two exciting updates from our missions committee. Uh, one of them is a missions organization that Bay Park has done a ton with over the years, Bethany Kids. And this Sunday, uh, the Move-A-Thon begins. And so if you haven't yet signed up, don't worry. We've heard about it earlier, but you can still sign up. Uh, there'll be a link in the chat if you're interested. So, And it can be any kind of moving. It can be biking or running or walking. I've even heard dancing is on the list. So I don't know about you Baptists. I know uh, Pastor Paul, he's, his favorite thing is dancing. So I'm sure if he's able to participate in the move thon he will for sure be doing some dancing. So if you're interested in the move-a-thon, uh, for sure, just let us know in the chat and we'll connect you with those pieces and we'll let you know how it goes. And we have one more exciting update, the virtual missions trip. Uh, so before we go any further, let's hear this update and a little explanation from Tim. Hi, Bay Park Baptist Church. My name is Tim Arkell and I'm the representative here at Partners International. And I just want to thank you so much for these many years of support and partnership that you've had with us and our partner in Lebanon. Many of you have met Joseph Najem and his team in Lebanon as he's come here to visit your church. And just wanna thank you for all those prayers and financial support for these many years. And so today is exciting because we are gonna go on a missions trip. Now, we're not gonna get on a plane or get any shots, but we're gonna do a virtual missions trip with your church to Lebanon. And you say, well, what is the objective? What is that going to look like? How are we going to do this? Well, we have three primary uh, objectives we'd love to see happen. Number one, we want to expose us as a church family to what God is doing through a local partner, through our national ministry, Joseph and his team, to be exposed to that firsthand and not just kind of hear about it, but to actually get as close to it as you can, exposure. Number two, we want to encourage the mutual fellowship between your team that's going to be representing your church and also the team at Feel. We want to hear each other's stories and testimonies to encourage and to teach each other and to pray for each other. This is an exciting time of fellowship to share with each other. So we want to encourage. And number three, we want to equip. We want to equip the team in Lebanon with some funds needed to do extraordinary ministry during these difficult times. As you're aware, Lebanon has been hit hard 
with an ec economic crisis, the Beirut explosion, COVID, many things are happening there to make it life really difficult. So this extra funding that will be raised and supported by your team to be used will come in very much in and help make meet many needs. Uh, you know, practically, what does it look like? What are we going to be doing here, and what's it going to seem like? Well, it's going to have a rich sense of the cultural and historical background of Lebanon. I don't know about you, but when I see, get to see other parts of the world and you get to hear somebody from there, it's such a great learning experience. So you're going to learn about that, the biblical history and the culture and some of the current context needs that they have. You're going to get a chance, like I said, to meet their staff and encourage each other and firsthand get to know each other a bit more and have that mutual time of fellowship. You're also going to get to attend an actual house church meeting. How exciting is that to see perhaps some former Muslims, Muslim background believers who have come to Christ and are now worshiping together. You'll get to hear their stories and perhaps share yours as well. You'll get to participate in the programs that they're running in the relief of the Beirut explosion and the Oasis program, which is the Syrian refugee crisis that has been going on there for some time. You'll do a lot of things like this, but I think what's most exciting about it is to firsthand hear what God is doing through other people's lives. And so there'll be a lot of learning and listening, as well as sharing our experiences. Now, some of us get a little nervous. What could I share to somebody who's in Lebanon? Oh, how would I, what do I have to offer? You know what? Sometimes just your presence over the video waves, sharing and caring that you cared enough to show up. And, and raise some funds for them. That's a huge communication. And then we can share that with our mouth and just encourage them and bless them of what they're doing there. You also get to visit a family. Visit a family that's receiving help and aid through this. So this is gonna be an incredible thing done all virtually, all over the internet and with video uh, and the team there. And so I have one question for you. Here it is. What do you say, Bay Park Baptist Church? Are you ready to go virtual to Lebanon? Thank you, Tim. Thank you for the update. And not only telling us the purpose and the vision for the trip, but also some of the details, how exciting it will be to go uh, into a house church and participate in a service with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ living in a different uh, atmosphere and just a way to encourage them and pray for them. So the team is looking for eight to 10 people and it is $500 each. If you're interested, there will be a link in the chat that will take you right to the link on the website. And if you need any more information at all, just email the office and we will connect you with the people that know all the things that you need to know. Well, before we go any further, let's pray together. Be Park. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a sovereign and good God. Thank you that you are a gracious Father, that you guide, that you direct, that you love us so incredibly. Thank you that even in this time of uncertainty and there's so much going on and all around our world, that you are still in control and that you still are weaving together a story of redemption that will end when you make all things new and perfect. And Jesus, we just praise you for uh, last week when Ryan was speaking, how he shared that you are the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, that as Philippians 2 says, that you came to earth and humbled yourself and took the form of man and, and went to death on a cross even a death on a cross. And it's through that death, that shedding of blood that we, the church, are invited to live in freedom and forgiveness. And so, Jesus, we just recognize what you've done. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you that it's through you and that we are able to have the fullness of joy and life that you invite us into. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are active and moving and present. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are not bound to a place like this church, but instead you are in each one 
who believes in Jesus. And so this morning, right now, as people are in their homes, Holy Spirit, we ask for your filling. We ask for your presence. We ask that maybe some of those common spaces where maybe there's tension or frustration or or just some chaos happening around, that there would be instead a moment or two where Holy Spirit, not only your presence is felt, but there would be um, a sense of your peace, of your encouragement, that you would speak uh, to Bay Park with what you're wanting us to hear through Ryan, through your living and active word. And so this morning, we just ask that even some of those ordinary places in our lives would become holy places designated to you where uh, Jesus, your rule and reign, is really invited into. And so this morning, as we continue to prepare to hear from you, God, would as we sing with the songs we sing, Help us to focus on you, focus on who you are, your goodness, your greatness on Jesus, your son, and Holy Spirit, would you lead us into truth this morning? In Jesus' name. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else could whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines?
In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophet To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt And praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. Well, Bay Park, before we dive into the message, we just want to make sure that you're ready. We're going to take just a moment to pause. And so grab your coffee, maybe grab your Bible. Actually, not maybe, for sure. Grab your Bible, your notepad, your pen, and let's get ready to dive into God's living and active word this morning.
Moraine Bay Park. If you don't know me yet, my name is Ryan. I'm the associate pastor here at Bay Park. And last week I was with you. We were talking about spiritual worship as we started our spiritual series. So often in this life, we get distracted with the things that we can see, taste, touch, the things that are material. And we forget about this whole spiritual realm that's all around us. And this series is all about remembering the spiritual aspect of our lives. So this morning, we're actually going to be returning to the exact same two verses we looked at last week. Romans 12, 1 to 2. If you follow along in your own Bible, you can start to open up there and get ready. Romans 12, 1 to 2. But first, let's pray. God, thank you that we can gather this morning online. Lord, Help us to put aside the things of this week that have just worn us down, are stressing us out, are distracting us. Spirit, move in our hearts and our minds to help us know you this morning, Jesus, through your word. And be with us today to learn from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans 12, 1-2. I'm going to read it nice and slow because it's just a couple verses. And we want, to, we want to taste God's word this morning. We want to take time to get a sense of what it says instead of just going through it super fast. So just two verses, nice and slow. Romans 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters... In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Well, here's a road map for our sermon this morning. We're going to start out with some bad news. And friends, the bad news is that we are mass produced by our age. If you don't know what that means, just hang in with me for a little bit. But the bad news as we're mass-produced by our age. But the gospel is that Jesus lives a different way, heaven's way, and helps us to do that. And the good news is that God is an artisan who is handcrafting us, that through Jesus, God is transforming us. So let's jump in. But just before we do, a quick game of Would You Rather. Would you rather a homemade quilt sewn by your grandmother or a $7 throw from Walmart? Would you rather a handcrafted birthday card or a card grabbed off the rack at Dollarama? And would you rather a custom-built car or just you know, your average civic. When given the choice between mass-produced and homemade, handcrafted, customized, most of us would choose the latter. Yet so often this preference for homemade, handcrafted, customized over mass-produced doesn't work its way into the way we choose to live our lives the values that we have. In that case, we so often fall into a preset mold. The Roman Christians lived in a very different culture than us. But like us, they struggled with being shaped and molded by this culture rather than by Jesus. Let me give you three examples of how the Romans were shaped by the world. 
Well, the Romans worshipped a plethora of idols. One would hope that the Roman Christians, after they became followers of Jesus, turned their back on these idols. But that was not necessarily the case. In fact, Paul spends the first and second chapter of, of Romans, the letter that we read from, telling the Roman Christians that these idols are not real, they should be abandoned, and Jesus is the creator of all things. Okay? Second was that the Roman Christians were living under Pax Romana. This was the promise of the Roman Empire that, that Caesar was a God-man and he would extend peace to the whole world through the Roman Empire's pursuits. And so Paul, diligent to remind the Christians that it's not the Roman nation or ruler who will bring peace, but peace is to be found in Christ, the pattern of the Roman Empire. And third example, a pattern of sexism. Roman culture disdained women. They were seen as inferior to men in their culture. So it's no coincidence when, in Paul's final words in the letter to the Romans, he lists greetings to many women, such as Tryphena, Tryphosa, and Persis, in order to highlight their contributions to the church. Paul is trying to show the Roman Christians not to treat women the way Roman culture was telling them to. So here's what I'm saying. The Roman Christians had to cast off these patterns of idolatry and the promises of the Roman Empire and even sexism all of which were rampant in their age. These were strong currents that the Christians could get swept up into. And Paul sums it all up so well in our reading today from Romans chapter 12. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of the world. The Germans call it zeitgeist, or we might call it pop culture or ethos. Whatever you call it, it looks different at different times and different places, but there's an unchanging reality. There is a mass production movement. The currents of our world sweep us up and move us through an assembly line that creates cultural clones that live according to the world. And do you know who owns this assembly line? The Satan, the enemy. He's the CEO of the earthly assembly line, shaping us to be people that live only according to ourselves. When Paul writes, do not be conformed, it is passive. Meaning, we are not always aware of this. Meaning, we don't wake up in the morning and say, hmm, oh, gee, I would like to live more like the world today than Jesus. What Paul means is that someone is shaping and molding us. The enemy. He was shaping and molding the Romans, and he's doing it with us today. It just looks a little different. In what ways are we conformed to the patterns of the world in 2021? To get a sense of this, I put an invitation out to some Bay Parkers and students I know, and I asked them this question. What are the ways you have been shaped by the strong currents of the age in which we live? What are some ways you've been shaped by the strong currents of the age in which we live? The stories I heard illustrate to me that there are some powerful currents in our country in 2021, and we can be swept up in them, even as Jesus followers. So here's just a small sample, just a, a few Examples of Satan's stencils. Let me give you three. First is the pattern of hustle and bustle. Our age is addicted to productivity. 
from 60, 70 hour work weeks to time hacks to dismissing all interruptions, we can get conformed to the pattern of hustle and bustle. As one person I talked to worded it, working endlessly for the sake of money, success, or identity overtook me during a difficult time in my career. I was feeling less successful than my family and peers and was struggling to make ends meet. So nonstop work was my solution. And how about the pattern of independence? For folks that don't believe in God, it's no surprise that they feel the compulsion to control their lives. But during an age that cries out for independence, of being in control of our own destiny, it's all too easy for Christians to get swept up in it too. We find ourselves trying to control our identity, our health, our wellness, even our mortality. And in doing so, we become functional atheists. We live as if God is not on the throne. As one person put it, I have fallen for the lie that in order to succeed, I must be in control of my life. I have sought out this control through money, attempting to control others, and at times avoiding prayerful consideration of my decisions. Or here's another one, our third one. We live in an age when the slogan is, if it feels good and doesn't hurt anyone, do it. Songs, TV shows, social media preach this priority. And so Christians find themselves swept up in this current, excusing their overindulgence of alcohol or food or real estate or recreation or whatever it is. We find ourselves spending our lives no differently than the rest of the world. Now, I could go on for a while because I think there are a lot of currents of our age that can form us. But three is enough this morning because my goal is not a guilt trip. Listen, I am just as guilty of getting swept up in those currents that I mentioned as anyone else, more than I would like. Whether you've been a Christian for 20 years or 20 days, we all have areas in which we are swept up in the current of the age. The goal today isn't to think about how our spouse or Bible study mate or that church down the road is conformed to the world. No, my question today is personal. My question is what are the ways you are being swept up in the currents of the age in which we live? What are the ways that you, nobody else, you are being swept up in the currents of the age in which we live? But as I said in our roadmap, there's good news. And the good news is that Jesus paves out a different way. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Jesus never, never conformed to the world. He was not one for the whims of the age, the advice of the time. No. I mean, Jesus did live as a Middle Eastern Jewish man, and he partook in Jewish customs and festivals, and he lived relatively peaceably under Roman occupation. He didn't go and build a cabin and hermit in the woods away from the mess of the world. But there's a difference between living in the world and being of the world, isn't there? There's a difference between being in the world, living in it, and being of the world. Jesus loves the world. Jesus loves the world. But he is still not of the world. Jesus is of heaven. As Jesus himself says in John chapter 8, you are from below. 
I, I am from above. You are of this world, but I am not of this world. Heaven has its own culture, its own unchanging ethos. Yes, Jesus celebrated weddings. He had friends. He worked a hard day's work. But he also gathered together a ragtag group of individuals the world said couldn't get along. He also honored lepers, women, children, and other minorities that the culture disdained. He called out sins that were fully acceptable in his day, and he called into question the national and religious narratives of his time. Jesus loved the world so much he came to it, but he loved the world too much to be of the world. Rather, he lived heaven's way in the world. He lived out an entirely different set of values rooted in the holiness of God. And then, at the heart of our Christian faith is the cross. And there is nothing more countercurrent, countercultural than the cross. The cross shows us that Jesus not only lived, but also died in a different way. Jesus now evermore lives heaven's way. Jesus refused to be affected by the age, and he helps us in our mission to do so as well. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, Paul writes, but I am so glad he doesn't stop there. Because he goes on to say, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Look, there is a way to get out of the enemy's assembly line. There is a way to overcome being molded by the whims of the world. Be transformed. Be transformed. Again, it's passive. Not transform yourself. God is the one transforming us. God is transforming us. The only other time Paul uses this word, transformed, is in 2 Corinthians 3.18, when he writes, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Notice again that in this verse, we are being transformed. And notice what we are being transformed into. We are being transformed into into the image of God. God is transforming us. God is transforming us through Jesus. And God is transforming us to be more like him. Friends, the question is not, are you being molded and shaped? The question is, who is molding you? The world wants to mass produce us. The enemy wants to stencil us in. But God offers his hands to shape us like a potter with clay, like an artisan in their craft. Bit by bit by bit by bit. Not all at once. God is transforming us to be more and more and more like him. The world sweeps us into the assembly line, but God slowly and lovingly recreates us into his image. A caveat. It's not that the world is all evil. It's just that it's not all good either. Like Jesus, 
We need to figure out how to be of heaven, not of the world, yet how to participate in the world and love the world, but not be conformed to it. And the only way to do this is for God to transform us. Then, and only then, as Romans 12, 2 goes on to say, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Then, we can discern what of God's goodness is in the world and what needs to be challenged. So how? How can we be transformed by God into his image? Well, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed. What do people do when they want to become more like someone they look up to. They might ask them to be their mentor and they might become their protege. At the very least, they start spending time together. And what happens when you spend time with someone? You become more like them. And it's no different with God. The Spirit helps us spend time gazing to God. We contemplate him, we worship him, we learn to love him. God gazes back at us as we gaze at him, and he makes us more and more into his image. In the stories I heard from the people, I also asked them how they became transformed instead of conformed. And do you know what every single story had in common? They spent time with God. They spent time with God. How do you break out from the hustle and bustle pattern? You Sabbath. We enter into God's rest when the world says we should be working still. How do you break out of the pattern of independence? Well, God teaches you to pray. When the world is quaking and shaking in disequilibrium, God steadies our steps. How do you break out of the pattern of overindulgence and luxury? Well, God shows you that you are richly blessed and have everything you need in Him. When the world thinks happiness is one Amazon click away or one exotic trip away, God shows you and brings you to Jesus' feet, and that is enough. There is a reason at church we tell you to read your Bible, to pray, to give, to rest, to worship, to serve, and to fellowship. It's not because these are religious chores. It's because these are ways God is inviting us to spend time with him, to gaze to him, to contemplate and love him. They are all ways that God is helping us look to him as he looks to us and molds and shapes us with his hands so that we are transformed bit by bit to be more like him. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good pleasing and perfect will. Let's pray. Father, we confess our conformity to the world. Place your hands on us, God, and shape us into your image and 
likeness. Jesus, help us to be able to say along with you, I am from above. I am not of this world. And Holy Spirit, teach us to discern what practices and patterns we should distance ourselves from and what elements of this world still reflect your goodness. God, help us to be spiritually transformed through your son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for paving the way so that we can undergo the greatest transformation by encountering and knowing you. Amen. Well, Bay Park, thank you again for joining us this Sunday. I pray that as you go into your week, you are looking for ways to love the world, but not be of the world. You might be familiar now with our three, two, one questions at the end of a Sunday service. These questions help you have conversations in your living rooms, in your life groups, and in your journals. You'll see three questions, two prayer prompts, and one challenge this week. We want to encourage you to always take advantage of these as much as you can to help continue to grow in your faith. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Go in peace. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you